Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. I have a unique, powerful, encouraging, inspiring podcast. I truly believe when we are finished with this conversation that you're going to say, wow. And here's why I say that. Not because of of the host, but because of the guest. And I am so excited to have this powerful lady with me today. She is doing some incredible things. And we're gonna we're gonna have you, we're gonna tap you into what she's doing. And by the end of this podcast, I promise you this will be one. I believe this will be one that people will go back and listen to time and again. Not that not to disparage any other podcast that we've done, but that the the message that Christina has is so important. She's a founder and president of End It For Good. You can go to enditforgood.com and find their resources there. But you can find Christina Dent right here, right now on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Christina, how are you today? I'm great. I'm so happy to be with you, Brian. Thanks for hosting this conversation and just having me with you. Well, I appreciate that. And, and again, if you're watching on YouTube, Christina looks much nicer than I do on this podcast. I'm rocking the hoodie and, you know, it's it's almost like she dressed for success today. And I, I just kind of feel underwhelmed here a little bit in myself. She, you know, but but no, it, what, what a pleasure to have you here, Christina. And, and let's start here. I've been starting this way in these podcasts for about the last, probably since the middle of last year when everybody was really locked in and locked down with with the pandemic. And we're still feeling some of the remnants and effects of, of that happening even 20, 21 months from now as we record this podcast. Walk me through the last 20 months or so for you and your family because I'm in West Virginia You're in Mississippi. So again, polar opposites. And I'm always curious how other people have dealt with things the last 20 months or so. Because I know what we've gone through here, but we're a state of 1.8 million people. I'd love to know what it was like there. So take me, walk me through the last 20 months or so, and maybe take me through a couple of lessons that you've learned, that you pulled out of the pandemic that you're going to carry with you going forward. Yeah, so the pandemic for us has been different than a lot of parts of the country. We've had um, not nearly as many lockdown regulations in Mississippi as other parts of the country have. Um, And so, you know, my kid's school has been very um, cautious and uh, continues to be that way. They go to... um, uh, private Christian school. And they do that because they just have a lot of families um, in the school that are multi-generational families. So they have a lot of um, children in the school, maybe whose grandparents live in the home with them. And so they've just tried to be really careful. Your Christian school reminds me of the Christian school that my son went to oh. here in West Virginia, because um, he went to a small Christian school that we we have been very much involved in and, and are still very much involved in. Do you feel like, and, and, and I'm, I'm, pardon me for jumping in there, but what you said really resonated with me there that th- they were trying to be cautious. Our Christian school was trying to be cautious. My niece now goes there. They were trying to be cautious as well with that. Do you feel like your, how do you feel like your kids did? And, and forgive me for jumping in there and, yeah. and, but you, you said something that really resonated with me about caution and things like that. How did you encourage your kids through what you guys were going through with being cautious and things like that? Because, you know, our kids were just so used to doing, you know, activities and sports. And, you know, I don't know about you guys in Mississippi, but we were playing basketball games and our kids were wearing masks on the, on the bench. Mm-hmm. You know, our kids were... You know, we we were we were 
we, you know, I, I couldn't mask up per se. I wore a face shield for the first game because I'm the public address announcer. It's kind of hard to wear a mask. You know, right. it, it would yeah. be, it would be kind of hard, you know, to, to talk through the, the mask and things like that. How did you keep your kids encouraged? Yeah. So my kids really adjusted great to masks. Um, I have, I've never heard them complain one time about it. My, my husband and I are much more annoyed about mask wearing than my kids are. They just don't care. Um, so that was just great that they were like, you know, whatever, no big deal. Now, when we were having to do virtual school, that was really hard. My husband and I both work and trying to do that. I have a, um, last year I had a first grader. And so, you know, you've got a first grader on a Zoom call for five hours a day. I mean, it was just. Are you sure you're down. not a closet West Virginia? <laughs> Are you sure that you're not, you know, it, it, if we, if we would sneak a peek and you're barefoot under the desk, then you would be a closet West yeah, Virginia. No, no. Um, Christina, so I never really dreamed. Well, listen, I never dreamed. I was telling somebody this one time on a podcast. I never dreamed that last year here, the the two things you wouldn't be able to find were toilet paper and webcams. Mm -hmm. I never dreamed in West Virginia those would be the two most popular items. Right. Yeah, yeah. Would, would be that. Yeah, yeah. take me, you, you mentioned your first grader being on a Zoom call. You, you and your husband working and things like that. What, how was your, ba how, how were you kind of your work-life balance? Because you're trying to do end it for good. You're trying to help a lot of people over here. Your husband's working. You've got a first grader on Zoom. God bless you. Keeping them, you know, occupied. Did you ever find yourself, I asked you about keeping your kids encouraged. How was it keeping yourself encouraged? And, and did you find it at times like, oh my gosh we need to do something different or, or we need to find some balance somewhere. I'm, I'm just, I'm really curious because, yeah, you know, the, the, the Christian school thing really resonated with me because I'm a parent of a Christian school graduate. And, and so I love that perspective there. Yeah. So, um, my husband and I both bought bikes at the beginning of the pandemic before, uh, no one could find bikes anymore. <laughs> And webcams toilet the... paper and bikes there we go i have to yes. add bikes to the list it was great and let me tell you this so i'm tall i'm 5'10 and i never i did not realize that there were even different sizes in bikes and so i went to I have a, um, a friend who i met through this work who actually lost his son to a heroin overdose a couple of years ago and he owns a bike shop in mississippi and so i drove two hours to his bike shop because i thought okay this you know he's going to tell me what i actually need to get and so, um, so he's taken out these different bikes for me to try. And he's like, yeah, this one's too small. And I'm going too small. I didn't know that was a thing. He was like, yes, there are sizes of bikes. So he, he has a, um, they built a little riding track behind their shop for people to test bikes out on. And he put me on a bike that was actually the size of bike for somebody my height. And it was like, my world was just revolutionized. I had no idea <laughs> bike riding could be so comfortable and enjoyable on a good quality bike that was the right size for how tall I am. And so I, I feel started... you. I'm six, three. So I feel yes, you. I'm, yes. I'm built like it. Well, I'm built like a tight end. So I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, um, I walk into the big and tall store. Well, sometimes I walk into the big and tall store. Sometimes I go into a, a department store and they're like, yeah, we might not have a two X for you. I, I know where I can't shop. I can't go to express. I don't shop at like the young people's store, you know, the great, you know, I don't go to Hollister or things like that. I'm pretty sure Hollister probably doesn't carry stuff for big guys like myself. So I totally feel you. I totally understand your, your pain. What, let me ask you this. I'm sure you know, the old expression is, you know, it's like riding a bike. You, you didn't know, you never know, you know, you never forget things like that. You, you probably didn't think, okay, they make bikes for taller people. What did you learn in that process? Because I, I could see you telling that story. And I can kind of imagine you going to the bike shop, picking up the bike that you were looking at. Was there a lesson that you learned in that process that, that was kind of one of those V8 moments like, this is, I, I never thought about that in this way, or there's a correlation there between this and what I'm doing. Yeah, I think, you know, 
maybe part of that and part of just the broader experience in the pandemic was, um, you know, my husband and I played ping pong a lot in the beginning of the pandemic. We had never done that before. I mean, our neighbors gave us their old ping pong table and every now and then the kids would kind of, you know, play a game on it, but they couldn't really figure it out. And then my husband and I started playing like every day in the first couple months of the pandemic. And I think just the, the biking thing and the ping pong, just the slowing down and realizing, you know, it doesn't, I don't have to take up biking every day of my life for owning a bike and taking a bike ride to be just a really great part of like my mental health. And so I ride every Sunday. Now I ride with one of my friends on Sunday afternoons she comes over. We have these trails that kind of run close to our neighborhood. Um, now she's a friend I've known for years, but we haven't we haven't really had a a, a way to kind of keep up as regularly. You know, we would see each other at church and things like that. Um, and now we're doing this dual thing. We get to keep up once a week together, and we get to get you know we ride probably 15 miles every Sunday afternoon together, and it's just been so great. And you know the ping pong we did it for a couple of months, and it's been a long time since we played. But just taking those times and and saying you know what we don't have to go on a date to just have like 15 minutes of fun out in the garage playing ping pong together. Um, and I think for a lot of the pandemic was just realizing that those small things that kind of, we think I don't have enough time for that. Well, you know, I scroll my phone on Facebook for more than 15 minutes a day. Certainly I've got yeah. time to just run out and play a, a quick game of ping pong and laugh with my husband and, and have fun doing that. So I, I really felt like that was part of the big overarching lesson from that for us was just the ability to say, we do have time for these things that we don't think we have time for. It's just that we're using that time in other ways and we're allowing the, the this kind of feeling of being busy all the time to crowd out the things that really help us connect to each other. I'm glad you brought that up because I have a I have a friend. He's been on this podcast, Ed Lattimore, and he talks about engagement is the new cocaine. And so you you dealing with addiction, and we're going to get into that here in a little bit. You mentioned scrolling through your phone. We, we all do that. And, and I think if we were really conscious of how much time we spent scrolling through our phones and you talked about, I, and I love what you said there just now. It's like, hey, I spend 15 minutes on Facebook and in the same amount of time, I can connect with my husband. We can play ping pong. And I love that. I play, it's probably why I didn't get my degree on time at Marshall was because I was playing too much ping pong in the Campus Christian Center. And not enough time actually going That's to great. class and doing what I was supposed to do. But I love what you said there because you are you're you are 100% right. When you talk about, you know, we say we don't have time to do this. Or we don't have time to do that. But we're scrolling on our phones. Let me go here for a second, if you don't mind. Could we be a society... That one day, and, you, and, and you, you, here's why I'm asking the question. You work with people that are addicted to substances. Could we be a society that one day we're treating people for addictions to their, to their phones and to social media and things like that? Because I think if I would look at myself in the mirror, I would say, man, I'm probably wasting more time than what I realized just mindlessly scrolling. I, I want to get your perspective there. Am I, am I asking that question correctly? Yeah, I, I think that's true today. And I think it's true. You know, we tend to think of, you know, people who are addicted as them and then the rest of us who aren't. And in reality, if we really took a hard look at our own behaviors, all of us have things that we go to when we are uncomfortable, when we are feeling emotions that we don't want to feel, uh, when we have memories that come up that are painful, um, when we just don't want to deal with what's right in front of us or our life is difficult or we're lonely. All of us have things that we go to. For some people, that's going to be scrolling on their phone. For some people, it's gambling. For some people, it's pornography. For some people, it's, um, you know, using a substance of some kind. It could be a legal substance like alcohol. It could be an illegal substance, you know, like heroin. But the the motivating factor for those kinds of, um, for those addictions to develop is similar things across the board. It, it isn't that, you know, there's this one kind of person who's a really bad person that gets addicted mm -hmm. to heroin. And then there's just like the nice people um, who don't. 
Uh, it's just that the, the, the fundamental root causes of addiction are the same across the board, no matter kind of what the, the process or the substances that the person becomes addicted to, um, which, you know, you can either see that in kind of a scary way, like, oh dear, so that could really happen to any yeah. of us. But yeah, it can. Um, but also that means that the, the pathway out of that is something we can all be part of. We can all be part of creating a culture that has better availability of deeply connected relationships for people of purpose and meaning and belonging. And those are the things that help people not use those unhealthy coping mechanisms and use healthy coping mechanisms instead and bring that pain into safe communities where their stories can be heard, where they can find uh, relationships and um and answers for some of those things that, you know, the the scrolling of Facebook isn't going to fix that problem, but it's just going to numb the the feeling that I have to deal with the problem for a little while. Um, and so there's all these kind of positive ways you can use uh, different things, and then they can turn into negative ways that you're using those things. Um, and that's just true across the board. And I think the 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 faster that we begin to kind of see all of ourselves on a continuum of Sometimes I deal with things well in my life and sometimes I don't. And sometimes for periods of time, I had a friend who said, you know, uh, I realized about halfway through the, the pandemic last year, I'm drinking more than I was before. Mm. And um, so I ended up talking to some friends about that and saying, hey, why don't we commit together um, that, you know, we're going to, you know, only drink X, you know, whatever. Um and so it was kind of that understanding of, hey, this isn't this this hasn't like destroyed my life or anything, but I'm recognizing that that one of the ways that I'm dealing with the extra stress of the pandemic is that I'm drinking more than is probably healthy for me. And so I'm going to take some steps to to work that back and do that in a community of relationship. And that's that's the core answer for us on addiction is um, bringing people into meaningful, safe communities where they can find connection and belonging and purpose. Let's step aside and take a break because when we come back, I'll, that's a great transition there to continuing this conversation into what you're doing and things like that. Cause I've got a couple of things I want to, I want to ask around that and take the, and drive the conversation this way and drive it forward. My guest is the founder and president of end it for good. Christina Dent, joining me today on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Come back in just a moment. Hey, everybody, Brian Sexton here. I want to tell you about our sponsor, SEO National. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Now, what's that, you might say? Well, Search Engine Optimization helps you show up higher on search engines in front of paying customers for words that you as a business owner can monetize. What a great concept. SEO National is owned by my good buddy, Damon Burton, who's been a guest here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Not only has Damon and his team worked with businesses of all sizes, from e-commerce startups to NBA teams and Shark Tank featured businesses, but more importantly, Damon and his team are about transparency, trust, and providing lifetime value. So much so that he still has his first customers after opening SEO National 14 years ago. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and call Damon and his team today at 855-736-6285 or go to www.seonational.com and get a free quote. Christina, you said before we took a break, you said that, um, you know, most people, that they're, you know, the people that, don't seem to have a problem in in air quotes are the good people and those people who are suffering through addiction things like that we society has classified them as the bad people in air quotes that is so profound because as you were saying that i thought to myself those people who are addicts at one time were probably accountants attorneys people in society that that people looked up to that you would have said before they had a problem oh that's that's a pillar of our community that's someone that is you know maybe it was a coach that coached kids you never know where addiction is going to surface itself or, or what people what happens to people that pushes them 
into addiction. And I love what you said there because we've stigmatized people in this society. And we've said, and especially the reason I say that is living in West Virginia, it has been, we've made national news for the wrong reasons. About four, almost, a little over four years ago now in Huntington, and, and I live about 15 minutes from Huntington, West Virginia for, for full disclosure. In one night, we had 26 overdoses. 25 were Narcaned and revived. There was one that didn't make it. And the, the glaring problem that we saw here was that our emergency medical system could not handle that volume of overdosing. And, and we, we, as a community, and again, I'm 15 to 20 minutes away, depending on what part of Huntington you're in. We're seeing it now. It's not just Huntington's problem. It's coming to my community and it's, and it's moving and it's moving across the river into Ohio and it's moving across the river into Kentucky. And so I just, when you said that, that really resonated with me. So let's go there a minute. When, when you think about where we are, how did the pandemic change addiction? Did we kick the can down the road in favor of COVID? And I don't mean to get political here, but I feel like that, that COVID just kind of, and forgive me for the long-winded question and, and taking it this direction. I feel like that, that COVID overshadowed everything. You know, like, like, oh, you know, oh, we, we've got COVID. Oh, my goodness. We got to mask up. We've got to do this and that. In the meantime, we still had people that, that were facing addiction issues. They weren't getting the kind of help that they needed because everybody was locking down. You know, those, those problems didn't go away. Forgive me for asking this incorrectly. And if I did jump in here. Is that something that you've seen in the last 20 months or so that we're not treating addiction like we used to treat it? Would there used to be a lot more resources and help or, it's, or it seems like, am I missing the boat here? Are we backing away from helping the addicted in favor of trying to recover the COVID patients? What are you seeing out there? Around I think it's that. not so much a backing away from helping as it is that the crisis has gotten much worse, but it's really important to understand why that has happened. Because um, so it, there's a combined forces of COVID creates loneliness, disconnection, loss of employment, um, you know, for some people, loss of housing or, you know, all of the things that can that can come as part of this experience that we've all been through. But for some people, that experience has been far more traumatic than for other people. Um, and so you have this. Now, those are all the things where addiction loves to grow is when people are um, disconnected and lonely and going through traumatic events or trying to recover from traumatic events. Um, and so we have that going on. At the same time, we have uh, lockdown, which disrupts the drug supply. So it disrupts the underground, the, um, you know, all of the routes that are previously happening. Now, they're still happening, but there has to be some, <laughs> some rerouting as, you know, different parts of the country are shut down and, okay, we got to get it in this way instead of that way. Yeah. So you have a disruption in the supply and you also, so you started out with a contaminated supply because of prohibition. So people are already using drugs on the street that they don't know what's in them. They're already contaminated. We have this fentanyl crisis that's happening with fentanyl. Yeah being um, contaminated, used to contaminate street drugs. That's happening all over the country. There's fentanyl everywhere um, because it's easier to smuggle because it's really potent. And so you have people who are isolated and disconnected. And a lot of times that means that they're, if they were in recovery, um, a lot of their recovery systems are disrupted. So maybe their AA meeting is not meeting anymore, or suddenly they were not able to go get their medication or go to the methadone clinic every day or what, whatever. Well, and let's think day, about so. it. Yeah. And let's think about it this way. You were talking about your first grader having a Zoom call. Okay. Most addicts don't have the resources to do telehealth. They need that one-on-one -on -one support system. I mean, they're, they're you know, getting, and, and I'm not trying to 
overstigmatize. I'm just thinking about our area here in West Virginia, in Western West Virginia. I would imagine it would be really hard for someone struggling with addiction to get on a Zoom call every day instead of being able to go to the to the methadone clinic or go to see a counselor. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, to yeah. get that help that they need. Uh, forgive me for jumping in there, but that, that just that thought just kind of pervaded in my mind. I'm, I'm thinking it's not the easiest thing in the world to get people who are struggling with a problem, who are trying to be on a regimen and schedule to try to get to, to get to truly get clean. And all of a sudden, the, you know, we lock them down and we disrupt and go, well, we'll, we'll see you on a Zoom call. Or right. we'll see you on a telehealth visit. That could be devastatingly disruptive. Pick yeah. up the conversation from there. I, and, and forgive me for jumping yeah. in there. That's just the, the thought that I had. Did yeah. you see a lot of that happening with the folks that you work with where that we're, you know, trying to, for the sake of, of keeping everybody safe, we, we kind of forgot people that really needed that that structure and that discipline to yeah. get better themselves. Yeah. I was talking to somebody who was working with um, kind of directly with patients that were at a treatment center. And one of the people who was there was there. Um, I think he's a doctor in another state and um, his part of his recovery uh, kind of the way that his recovery has worked for him is that he got really into physical fitness. And so his gym closed down with COVID. And so this thing that had been kind of a, a central piece of his recovery lifestyle was not available to him anymore. And he ended up relapsing and ended up coming back to treatment again. So that's just happening at this massive scale. Um, and also you have this contamination piece of that people are using drugs that they don't know what's in them. And now the disruption has created, maybe they can't buy from their usual dealer, they're buying from somebody else, that's even more um, uncertainty over what's in the, the substance. Um, and fentanyl is everywhere now. And now, now it's important to say fentanyl is not um, lethal in terms of, you know, everyone who ever takes fentanyl dies from it. There are millions of people who use fentanyl every day who are not dying from it. Um, and fentanyl is used in every single hospital in this nation every single day yeah. for pain management. Um, it was given to my my first grader who's, when he was four, he went to the ER and um, he had cut his finger really badly. They had to do stitches and the nurse comes in and she says, hey, I've got some fentanyl for him um, to help with the pain before they do the stitches. Now, you know, you have grown men who are dying of fentanyl poisoning every day from drugs they bought on the street. And yet in a hospital setting, my four-year-old could get fentanyl, multiple doses of fentanyl. Yeah. And it's a it's a helpful thing. And that it's not fentanyl that's killing people. It is the way that they're getting it, which is in this unregulated form on the street where they don't know how much to take. And it's really potent and you can easily overdose instead of get high. So we have lots of combining problems that have um that were all part of the pandemic. Uh, some of them that had happened beforehand, fentanyl was already on the streets beforehand, but the the number of people whose either recovery journey was disrupted because of the um, pandemic, or maybe their drug use had not been problematic before, but the experiences of the pandemic um, shifted, slid their drug use into problematic addiction rather yeah. than just, you know, recreational use. And so, yes, there's lots of of problems related to that. But if we don't understand why those numbers are so high of overdose deaths, the CDC, I think just two days ago, maybe released over a hundred thousand people died of an overdose in that. 2020, which is you know unprecedented. Uh, nowhere in the world has ever experienced that before, but we have to understand why that's happening. The contamination has to be addressed. Um, and that's one of the things in it for good works on is, is bringing these substances back into a regulated form so that people aren't using random baggies of stuff that they're buying on a street corner and dying as a result. Um, not even necessarily of the contents of the bag, but of the fact that they don't know what's in it or how much to take or, you know, how much is going to get me high versus kill me. Um, and, and those problems are going to be with us and we're going to continue to lose lots and lots of loved ones until we can address the root causes of why so many people are dying. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, but the way I understand how fentanyl is getting smuggled in too. You mentioned the effect of fentanyl. You mentioned a, a few minutes ago. I would think, and and again, I'm starting, and, and if I'm not putting two and two together correctly, please correct me. I want to make sure that I'm factual in what I say. And that is, 
it seems like the fentanyl is the 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 fentanyl the the dealers are trying to make it even more potent by putting extra ingredients in it to give it a more powerful effect than just using regular like you mentioned fentanyl used in hospitals are you are are you seeing more of that adding in more things to it to make it a more powerful high when people take it as opposed to what is that am i missing something there because i want to make sure that i'm clear about this because i i can i can imagine most people would say okay fentanyl they give it to you in hospital to to kill pain why are people dying from fentanyl poisoning and i would have to think that to to get the more powerful high that people are seeking from it there has to be something added to it to give that more powerful potency so that's a really great question because i i think of just as I'm reading news stories, I hear that a lot of, you know, kind of, we can get people addicted if we give them more potent things. Um, I think that's actually a, a, a misrepresentation of why fentanyl entered the, the street drug scene. Um, it, so anytime you have to smuggle something, it has to be, you want it in the smallest package possible. Um, so you want to provide what consumers want, but you want to do that in a way where your risk is lowest if you're providing something that's, you know, illegal currently. And so, so the introduction of fentanyl on the street is far more driven by just the, the economic factors of prohibition. Um, I heard somebody characterize it as, you know, it used to be you had to smuggle an entire boatload of heroin. Now you can smuggle a suitcase of fentanyl. Well, that's far more cost effective and far more risk effective. Uh, you know, you're, you can send fentanyl through the mail um, and you can send a very small package and it's enough to make thousands and thousands of doses of fentanyl. Um, and fentanyl is so potent that, you know, people are, they may have in their mind, well, you know, it's one teaspoon versus two teaspoons of fentanyl, like volume wise. No, no, no. We're talking about like tiny <laughs> milla, milla, milla. Micro droplets. Yeah. Yes. Like tiny. This is not, you know, like a big bag of powder versus a little bag of powder. This is like tiny, tiny. If you get this wrong, um, you're going to be dead. And so, you know, it's not like the nurse is giving my son, she's yeah. giving him pure medical grade fentanyl. That's also mixed with something so that it actually is big enough that he could actually ingest it. You, you are really hitting on something there. And we're going to transition seamlessly to your story and how you got involved in this. But you're making an excellent point is that people, and I don't want to trivialize this, Okay, I, I'm not trying to trivialize this. But you have people that are distributing these things that are thinking about these, these factors. They're thinking of legitimate business practices. Yes, this is a business. L like, yep. like someone would if they were distributing, let's say they, were, they owned a grocery store, like your local mom and pop grocery store. They have to bring it in as cost effectively as they can put a markup on it and sell it as profitably as they can, thinking about competition around them and how they figure. It's the same thing in, in that world. And, and a lot of times we just think, oh, these are bad people. They're, they're ruining our society and things like that. When if we stop and think about it, they're using the same business principles as the, as the person running the local pizza shop yep. that we frequent and things like that. I appreciate the fact, Christina, that you broke it down for us like that, because I think now we've gotten some relativity, there's some relatability there. Like, okay, I see now why people choose to do this. I see now why people doesn't make it right, but you can start to see where I, I have never heard it explained the way you explained it. I, I'm grateful for that. I want to pause here and take a quick break because I want to get into your story and how all of this comes together because you have a powerful reason. You have a powerful why behind End It For Good. I want to make sure that we save lots of room to explore that. My guest is Christina Dent, the founder and president of End It For Good. You're going to want to stay. I'm pr I promise you this is going to be good. You're going to want to hear Christina's story. We'll get to it in just a moment.
Hey everybody, Brian Sexton here. We are in the season of gift giving. Everywhere you go, whether you go to a store, you go online, the gifts are out to be gotten. I've got a gift idea for you I think you're going to love. It's my book, People Buy From People. Ten powerful people lessons from the ultimate people person, my dad. If you know someone that would love to be a better connector, or you want to help them get there, people buy from people is for them. Leaders, if you've got teams that you want to connect better, deeper, powerful, both internally and externally, people buy from people is for them. If you want to connect like you've never connected before, pick up a copy of People Buy From People. You might say, Brian, where do I get a copy? Very simple. Go to Amazon.com, search People Buy From People, Brian Sexton. You'll find it right there. There's also a Kindle version available and an Audible version read by me. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and go today, get your copy, People Buy From People. I promise you, you won't regret it. And now let's get back to more great conversation here on the Intentional Encourage Podcast. Christina, take me through your story. We've, we've kind of touched on, again, I could spend two hours. We could explore a lot of different ways and topics and things about this. And the insight that you've provided, I don't think I've ever heard insight that you've provided the way you've provided it. So one, thank you for doing that. But let's dive into your story Walk me through how you started on this journey. What prompted you to start in it for good? And you just go, I mean, I'll just kind of, if, if I can, be quiet and just kind of sit back and relax. But you just take this where you want it to go and really just tell the, the audience your why and your story behind End It For Good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, Brian. So um, I was born and raised here in Mississippi, and I grew up in a wonderful Christian home, um, a conservative home. I was homeschooled, actually, kindergarten through high school, and never used drugs while I was growing up, never had any interest in that. Um, I went to a Christian liberal arts university, and I got a degree in Bible, never used drugs while I was in college either. Um and so I, I'm kind of the last person that you would ever think would be uh, working on these kinds of issues of rethinking how we approach uh, drugs and addiction. Um, because really my, my story isn't one of, you know, somebody who had a terrible addiction and came out of that and is in recovery. It's not a radically changed lifestyle. It is a radically changed mind. And um, so for my whole life, really, until just a couple of years ago, I would have said, you know, drugs are bad and drug use is bad and outlawing drugs is the right thing to do. This is just so obvious. How could anybody even think twice about this? Um, and then seven years ago, we became a foster family. And I did not understand anything about addiction at that point. Um, and through that journey, I ended up meeting a woman named Joanne. And Joanne had... Um, struggled with addiction for many years. She had started using when she was in her early teens and um, she was not able to beat that addiction during her pregnancy with her first child. And so when he was born, he was removed from her custody and put in foster care because of her prenatal drug use. And he was brought to our house and we became his foster family. Um, and I could not fathom how a mom who possibly loved her child could use drugs while she was pregnant. Who would do that? I had no category in my mind for that. And so to me, what that said was, well, clearly she doesn't love her child and thus he's better off with us um, than with her. And so I brought Beckham, her son, to his first visit with Joanne at our local child welfare office. And I had not met her before. Um, so I popped his car seat out of my van. I turned around in the parking lot and here comes this woman literally running across the parking lot towards me and she's weeping and she runs over and starts covering this little tiny baby with kisses and talking to him. This is my first meeting of Joanne. And I honestly, Brian, I just felt so suspicious. I thought this doesn't make any sense. Uh, somebody who loved their child this much wouldn't have made those choices while she was pregnant. So do you think she, that was a part of your upbringing? Forgive me for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you feel like, and I know that this is a strong word, but it's the only word that really kind of fits with this scenario. Do you feel like your, 
your your prejudice that you had with your upbringing because I had a, a real similar upbringing. You know, mom and dad, church belief. You know, going to church. We 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 went to church Sundays, Wednesdays. I couldn't play Little League. If we had practice or a game on Wednesday night, I wasn't allowed to play. So we had church. You know, that you, you just, you know, fear the Lord, fear your mom and dad, you know, toe the line, the whole, the whole thing. Do you feel like that the way you grew up influenced the way you thought, especially in that moment when you meet Joanne for the first time? Yeah, definitely. So I never remember my parents really saying anything about addiction. I mean, I certainly knew that they were against drug use, uh, but they never they never were like making ugly comments about people struggling with addiction. But I definitely the the culture that I grew up in, I got the clear message that people with addiction are bad people doing bad things. Um, it, so that sort of internal. Uh, you know, that somebody struggling with addiction, maybe like you were talking about earlier, maybe they used to be the accountant, but really somehow deep in their heart, they were sort of hiding the bad person they really are. And now we're seeing the bad person they really are because of this addiction. We just, yeah. we saw the facade earlier and I would, it breaks my heart that that is still largely our cultural understanding of addiction because no, the, the accountant, that's who they really are. They're also struggling with something else, but it's not because, uh, you know, we've misjudged their character and really they were, you know, this untrustworthy person all along. Um, and I, yeah, I think it just, it was, it was just part of the air that I breathed as part of growing up in a, in an American culture, um, probably even more so growing up in a, a conservative evangelical culture. And there's a, there's a, attention there because I, I recognize the desire for parents to discourage their children from drug use. And so there's this, you know, pull on us to like, if I can make them like not like people like that, then maybe they won't want to become that kind mm -hmm. of person. And so we, we kind of use the stigma as a tool to discourage kids from drug use. And yet what ends up happening is uh, many children try drugs for those who become addicted, whether it's to drugs or anything else. Now that shame is deeply embedded in them. I have yeah. become that bad person. That's how the world sees me. Well, it's not like Christina, it's not like, and, and, and the people that you work with, it's not like, I don't think anybody starts out to go, you know what? My, my goal from the first time that I did a line of cocaine or the first time that I tried drugs, my goal was to get addicted. From the first time that I tried that, I wanted to become an addict. I don't think you could talk to anybody that would say, you know what? That was my ultimate goal. Here's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to, be, to become an addict and mess my life up and destroy my family. That's what I what I really set out to do. I think you're 100%. I mean, I know you're 100% right. You 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 talk about meeting Joanne Beckham's mom for the for the for his birth mother for the first time. She she is doing what any mother would do. Loving loving her son. Th this kind of you, you, you weren't really sure how to take it. As you got to talk to Joanne, what were some of the things that connected you with her and how did you begin to understand her story and what she was going through? Yeah. Um, those are great questions. So that, so I met her just that one hour and actually I left so she could have that one hour of visitation with her son um, by herself. And after that, she left for inpatient drug treatment. And, um, but she would call me from treatment and say, you know, can you put me on speakerphone? And she would sing to Beckham over the phone. And it just tore my heart out because I felt this like tension, just, it's like this, un, you know, the tension gets to a certain point where you just have to like deal with it in some way of, wait a second, she is 
she is showing more vulnerable, raw love and care for her son in a way that I'm not even sure I could do. Like, I think my pride would keep me from doing that. I think I would be like, you know what? I'm not going to let somebody else see this side of me. I'm not going to let them see this deep longing for my son. I'm going to be like, I'm okay. I got this. (laughs) And she was showing me this other side. And so um, it really challenged me. So it challenged me because it challenged my heart, my own heart and my own judgment and my own Um, discarding of the lives of people and the kinds of people I thought were people who would struggle with addiction. It also um, uh, really challenged, you know, I also knew that we were putting people like Joanne in prison every day. And so there's this Mm -hmm. kind of dual challenge happening of, wait a second, if, you know, we're engaged in foster care because we want to help vulnerable families and children. And what's going to happen to Beckham if we put Joanne in prison for five or 10 years Um, that's not going to help her. Drugs are readily available in prisons and jails. It's not Mm going to help Beckham. He's going to be separated from the mom, you know, who clearly loves him and wants to be there for him and raise him. Um, And then Joanne's going to come out of prison and she's going to be deeply traumatized. And the more that I learned about addiction, the more I realized, oh my gosh, trauma is like the number one driver of addiction. It's, it's, for people who have had traumatic events happen to them, particularly if it happened in their childhood, um, that is one of the the biggest indicators of risk factors for addiction to develop because addictions are a coping mechanism for other things. We tend to think the drugs are the problem. No, no. The drugs are a solution attempt to another problem that's happening in a person's life or something that happened to them before. And so I could just seeing this domino effect of harm of, gosh, we would harm Beckham. We would harm Joanne. Joanne's going to come out. She's going to have, you know, she would have a felony. She would, how is mm-hmm. she going to rebuild a life and get a job and be there for Beckham and deal with the five or 10 years of trauma that she's experienced in prison and try to rebuild a bond that has been severed between her and her child. Mm-hmm. And I knew from foster parent training The bonding of parents and children is incredibly important, not just for them to feel a bond together, but for the development of a child, like their emotional development is bonding is such a big piece of that. And we're, we're severing that bond over and over and over again with all of these parents who were putting in prison for their, what I would say is their health issue of drug use. Well, and Christina, I've got to jump in here because you, you're really this is such riveting conversation. And again, not to be political about this, but you you said something fascinating there. We punish drug users in the same way we punish murderers and thieves and, and rapists and things like that. Because here, here's the difference. When you murder somebody, you injure them and their family. When you steal, you injure a business owner and their livelihood. You, you potentially injure other people, you know, by proxy, you can injure other people. Obviously, with rape, there's another person involved. You injure that other person. When you use drugs, the only person that you hurt is yourself. Most In most cases, now, unless, you know, you do something under the influence of drugs where you you get behind the wheel of a car or you do something like that, then other people are involved. But if it's just drug use that puts you in prison, the only person that you're hurting is yourself. But yet the laws are written to where they have equal weight with injuring other people. And and I love the way you're 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 bringing this conversation because folks, I hope you're thinking The same ways that when Christina's talking, I'm thinking like, wait a second. Our laws are not equally weighted. We're putting someone in prison that abuses themselves. Nobody else gets hurt except them. They're the one losing their teeth in some cases. You know, if you do meth, you can see where people lose their teeth. They injure their own bodies. You know, with, you know, if they, if they're doing, if they're shooting up heroin, they're the one abusing their own veins. If 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 I do heroin, Christina doesn't get hurt. It's not her veins that are being abused. It's mine. And, and I'm just, that's the first time, Christina, and I'm so grateful that you brought that piece of the conversation to it. It's the first time I've ever heard someone say, we don't wait 
the violations equally. And I hope that someone is listening. I hope someone in a, in a state legislature, I hope a delegate or someone involved in state government is listening. I hope someone involved in federal government is listening. That maybe we can help folks instead of, instead of immediately just going, okay, you get five years for that. You get 10 years for that. I hope that we can find some way to, to, to find rehabilitation for these folks because it just doesn't seem to me that we're weighting the laws equally. Is that what you find, Christina, as you work with folks in, in your organization? And I hope I didn't overstep there. I, I'm, I'm trying to be very respectful and things like that, but you really delivered something very powerful, and I, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, so I I'll 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 be the, my own devil's advocate here and say what are what are people thinking when they hear us talking about that? Um, they're thinking addiction does hurt other people because look at all of the families. Look at Beckham; his mom's addiction is hurting him. So it it's not just an individual you know choice. So I totally agree with you. It is um, it is a, an individual choice in that what you what you ingest in your own body. Um, currently, the government is trying to regulate. Um, trying to, you know, force you by removing your freedom, by putting you in jail sure. to, to force you not to use a substance. Um, so I, I would I would encourage people to think about the way that we handle other addictions. So we don't say just because a gambling addiction can destroy a family, we're going to put all gamblers in prison. Or just because a pornography addiction can destroy a family, that we're going to put everyone who uses pornography in prison. We do do that with particular substances. Um, and we recognize uh, that addictions can harm other people. And yet, the best way to reduce harm even to their families is not to remove this person from society for five or 10 years and then try to send them out on their own with a felony to go rebuild their life and try to find a job where they can potentially support anyone, including themselves. So there's a there's a both and of, yes, uh, we are, we're trying to force people to make a personal decision. Um, and yes, we also recognize sometimes that personal decision has impacts on other people, as do lots of decisions we make. Uh, the decisions I make affect my family, whether or not they're related to any addiction that I have, yeah. and they can be really devastating for my family. And yet, if we try to, to force people by removing them from their families for multiple years out of their lives, is that the right thing that's actually going to help that family flourish? So I think for so many families who are who have a family member who's struggling with addiction, the experience is so painful that there is, it's so difficult not to have this knee-jerk reaction of, we just have to force them to stop. And yet, if you talk to any family who's ever been through addiction, they will all tell you, you can't force someone to stop mm -hmm. because until they're ready to stop, you can do whatever. You can cut them off. You can scream and yell at them. You can whatever. Uh, and you can't force them to stop until they become ready to stop on their own. And I, so I love, I don't normally talk about this, but you brought up the sort of, um, you know, whether it's a, a, a crime that hurts another person versus a mm -hmm. crime that hurts yourself. Um, I heard somebody was talking to me about this one time and they said, yeah, you know, did you know that if you have a crime committed against you and the person who was caught for that is incarcerated, when they are released, you will be notified of that. Like if, um, you know, whoever the victim is, is notified on the release of uh, the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. But when you get to drug crimes, no one is notified because there's no there's no victim to notify. It's a, it's a crime against yourself. Um, so they're not notifying you that you're getting out of prison because you already know. That was really interesting to me to think about, oh, yeah. I've, I had never thought about sort of the way that we think about crime as, you know, um, you know, crimes against other people. Another really interesting point, I don't think most people realize that the vast majority of violent crimes are never solved. So if wow. you have something stolen from you, if you are carjacked, um, if you are raped, uh, there is a far greater chance that the perpetrator is never going to be caught than there is a chance that they are. So even if, for people who are listening, even if they say, I don't care about people who use drugs at all, and I just say, lock them all up, I would, I would ask them to consider what would you rather our law enforcement resources be spent on? Would you rather they be spent on um, arresting people for 
uh, possessing drugs, or would you rather they be spent on finding the perpetrators and prosecuting them for, for actual victims who are out in the world, for people who have had loved ones murdered, for people who have been the um, victims of rape, for people who have had their things stolen from them, for people who have been assaulted. Um, most of those crimes are never solved. And we have to just decide what kinds of things do we actually want our law enforcement resources going towards. And I yeah. think for most people, they because what they see on the news is a high profile murder and a high profile arrest they don't recognize that there's lots of other things crimes being committed there's lots of victims out there and that for most of those victims they're never getting justice there's not enough resources and yet you know here in mississippi so we just released a study a couple of months ago and we looked at a five-year period of time and over those five year that five-year period of time about half of violent crimes were never solved and during that same uh, period of time five thousand people were arrested for drug possession so you have this like you know this isn't trafficking this isn't anything like that it's just possessing a drug that yeah. you know we've said they, they can't be in possession of so there's just a cost benefit even um even if there's no compassion there for the causes of drug use um if we want a safer society we got to look at what we're actually spending those law enforcement resources on i love that i've got to ask if if we can you mentioned joanne your your foster son Beckham, his his birth mother. She calls you from a treatment center and she wants to sing to her baby over the phone. How did Joanne change your life in what you decided to do? Take me through that part where Joanne really changed your life. Mm, I feel like tears coming up behind my eyes when you asked me that because I... I'm so thankful for her. I feel like she, um, now she would, we've done some interviews and things together and she would say the same thing of me. She would say, you know, you were a mom to my son when I couldn't be there for him for that period of time. Um, but I, it was her, her vulnerability that just reshaped me. Um, and really, so, so I met Joanne and, and really started rethinking how we handle drug use and addiction. And that set me on this journey of learning, uh, okay, wh what are we doing with drugs? Like, is there something we could be doing that's better? Um, and that's really where I learned kind of what we were talking about earlier about contamination that's happening because of drug prohibition. Um, the vast majority of crime that we have is caused by drug prohibition. It's not caused by people ingesting drugs and going and doing something crazy. It's caused by taking a massive market and not allowing it to operate in a legal environment. And so instead it operates in an illegal environment and you only have gangs and cartels that are in charge of these you know, particular drugs that we have prohibited. And so you have this in enormous amounts of violent crime that are caused by drug prohibition, enormous amounts of overdose deaths that are caused by contamination, and then enormous amounts of incarceration that are caused by incarcerating consumers. And so I really kind of, it started with Joanne and it grew into this big rethinking of how we approach drugs as a whole. And um, that completely changed my mind about the best path to reduce harm. So instead of just thinking drugs are bad, outlaw them, I now think, you know, drugs can be really harmful. So we really need policies that best reduce harm because that's the thing we're worried about with drugs. We're worried that they're harmful. Um, so can we have policies that actually focus on harm reduction rather than on sort of a knee jerk, you know, it'll fix it if we just make it illegal. And the reality is it hasn't fixed it and it's made it incredibly more harmful. Um, and so now we have this trail of dead bodies from either crime related to violence from the underground market or preventable overdoses. And then this trail of millions of destabilized families. So for me as a Christian, um, you know, as somebody who, who prioritizes human life as made in the image of God, um, the more I learned, the more I just felt like I can't support these policies anymore because of the sheer destruction of human life that's part of them. Certainly, can drugs harm you? Absolutely. But policies should not compound that harm. And that's what our drug policies are currently doing. And so, um, you know, Joanne was the catalyst for me of 
of learning, of taking the time to say, what are we doing? And is there a better way? And as I thought through, okay, you know, God has given me this passion for vulnerable kids and families. Um, I, I felt like the best thing that I can do, I think that has the, would have the biggest reach would be to work on providing education and advocacy around changing our drug laws, because they are one of the single most harmful, um, sets of policy that we have right now, and they harm vulnerable people the most. Um, you know, the more vulnerable the person, the more likely they are to get caught up in the criminal justice system, the less likely they are to have the resources to, you know, get uh, an attorney and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so I, it is out of that same heart that brought me to foster care that I started End It For Good as an advocacy and education nonprofit here in Mississippi. We do some work nationally too, but a lot of our work is, is just doing events um, related to rethinking how we're approaching drugs. And we have found, you know, people say, are you kidding in Mississippi? You know, you're talking about ending drug prohibition. You're talking about legalizing and regulating substances. Like that is super controversial. How can you do that in Mississippi? Mississippi. And what we have found is we are, we're presenting that information, not because we want people to use drugs. Like I've, I've never used marijuana. I don't have any interest in, in drug, yeah. in drug use. We're interested in people and in families and in, in society being a place of, of stable family structures and people that have the best opportunity to thrive. And that's what I'm interested in. And that's what is bringing more and more people to events that we do. Um, we just did a summit, our first full day conference, and we had 250 people in Mississippi coming and we're presenting uh, big ideas of shifting, talking about um, legalization or harm reduction, syringe services, like lots of things that people like me who are conservative and, and Christians are going, whoa, 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 this does not, this sounds like uh, really yeah. difficult. Um, and yet, when when we give them an opportunity to come, to be respected, to engage in dialogue, we have found people are desperate for a better way because most of them are suffering with addiction in their families, and they are doing that often in silence, um, but they are looking for, desperate for something that actually produces better outcomes. And we think if we want better outcomes, we have to actually rethink what we're doing with drug policy because the root causes of a lot of our harms are actually policy created, not drug related. And that's where we want to for people to really focus in on. If you're worried about what heroin is doing in our country or what fentanyl is doing, you have to be looking at the root causes. It's not heroin and fentanyl. Um, it is the, the policies that are making those things so difficult. And we invite people into that journey. It, it took me two years to change my mind. So, you know, Brian, you've got listeners who are going, uh, this is like what you know. She, I, I don't even know where to. to you're put making this, people, this journey. <laughs> Christina. You're making people like myself, and 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 listeners out there. You're really making us rethink what we've always thought about addiction and and things like that. And I have, I have some background in in addiction sciences as a disease state, so I understand a, that myself. But where I think I fell a little short, and, and I'm so grateful for this conversation, I believe where I fell a little short was not understanding those root causes. Assuming that I knew what the root causes were. It's like, oh, drugs bad, you know, treatment good. When in actuality, to your point, it takes some people three, four, five, six times in, in a, in, and I had Clay Hodges on my on my podcast. And Clay talked about, he's like, I was in and out of treatment three, four, or five times until I finally got clean. And so again, treatment, treatment seems like a wonderful thing, right? We just say, okay, let's get that person into treatment and everything's going to be good and all is well. And um, I, I watched... Forgive me for kind of going off script here, but I watched a video. I watched something on YouTube, and and, and I would highly encourage you to do that. One of a, a singer, a Christian singer that I grew up listening to, is a man named Russ Taff. If if for Christian out there, Russ Taff, as the kids would say, is an OG. Russ Taff was was the man. 
And Rush Taft talked about battling alcohol addiction and being in and out of treatment and thinking he'd overcome it. Multiple times, Rush Taft was in and out of treatment centers. Nobody even knew it. I think of a, a, another OG Christian singer, a guy named Michael English, who battled a, a drug problem and was in and out of treatment. And again, I, I, I Christina, I'm grateful that you have brought to us. Just because you go to a treatment center doesn't mean that everything is going to be sunshine and roses when you come out. And it's it, it's that those root causes behind it. So I want as we finish this conversation, we could go for hours, but I want to I want to be respectful of the audience's time. If if somebody is listening to our conversation and they know someone, maybe it's a family member, a close friend that's struggling with addiction, do you have a piece of intentional encouragement from the journey you've walked that you could share with those folks? Yeah, so I have not had um, a cl I have not walked with someone closely um, who's been walking through addiction, um, but. I have a lot of friends who are either in recovery or who have walked through that with family members. By the and way, how is Joanne? Let's yes. kind of put a, a bow yes. on that. Yes, put a bow on that. So she's doing great. Um, she works now full time helping other people get into treatment at a, at a treatment center. She's the intake coordinator um, and is doing well. And Beckham is in kindergarten this year and is doing great. And she is just... Um, really her life has just completely turned around. Um, and it was just, it's just been incredible to be part of that. We stay in touch and I see her every now and then, and it's been really amazing. But to your point, it how's her relationship that way. with Beckham? Great. She's parenting. He was only with us for a short time. Um, and she was able to find, there are, I think only two treatment centers in Mississippi that have, um, a program where parents can bring young children with them because they really believe in this bonding process and that for parents, even in treatment, it can be a helpful um, motivator for them. If they're every day, they're seeing that child that they want to get better to be able to parent. So he was able to join her for part of her time in, in treatment and um, yeah, they have been doing great. So, um, so that's great. But to your point, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, I have another friend, she went to treatment eight times and is, has been sober after that. And she said, you know, every time I got a little bit better, I ended up relapsing all those other, the other seven times, but I, I got a little piece of the puzzle. Um, and so I, what I have, what I've learned, what I hope I can implement if I have a child who struggles one day is, um, that, maintaining a relationship, maintaining an open door, um, not an open door for like, you know, you can come and take my stuff and I'll give you money and whatever, like boundaries are important. You, you, if you have somebody that's in chaotic addiction, I'm not at all saying you don't need boundaries, right. but what that person needs most, the only way that they're going to find sobriety is if they can find a community of deep relationship and deep connection. Um, Johan Hari has a viral Ted talk called, um, everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. And I would encourage people to, to watch that. I did a TED talk on my journey as well. Um, and, but his, he specifically is talking about addiction and about what helps people out of it and what keeps them stuck in it. And I have found so many people who have been through addiction that have watched that and said, that explains what happened to me. That explains my journey and my family couldn't understand it. And I didn't even understand it. Um, but, but cutting off relationships with people, um, it, you know, it, I would never blame someone for that because I have not walked in your shoes. And yet uh, we have to keep in front of us. What is it that actually helps people recover? What is it that helps them out of it? It's being in a place where they can deal with and, and shed all of the shame that they feel. And they can find all of those things that all of us need to be healthy. We all need relationships. We all need a community where we are loved unconditionally. We all need a place where we can find purpose. Um, and we can help provide that. You know, it may be um, at our at our conference, a mom came up to me and she said, you know, my my son is in Denver on the streets. He's homeless right now. I don't know where he mm -hmm. is. I don't know if he's okay. Um, and so, you know, so we're in Mississippi and her son's in Denver. Well, there's a mom in Denver whose son is in Mississippi and he's on the streets in Jackson and she doesn't know where he is. So wherever we are, 
we can be part of, of offering an open, an open hand to give people a place to connect and to find relationship again. That's really complex and it's really messy, but the, the point always stands that that is what leads to human flourishing. And even if it's hard, even if we just want to blame and scream at people for their behavior, that's not going to change their behavior. The that's things right. that help people change is helping them to thrive. And that's bringing them into a community of safety and trust um, and trying to help them develop that and provide that when they're able to receive that and, and keeping them alive until they are. And that for a lot of us right now, this is kind of the single big problem that we have is so many people are dying before they can get to the point of being ready um, to make that step to enter long-term sobriety. And that, we have to deal with that. It, it will continue to happen until we deal with the contamination in the drug supply. Fentanyl's not going away. It's with That's us. Right. Now there's car fentanyl. There's new things. It's going to get more and more potent. The problems of, of prohibition are going to be with us until we can really latch onto those root causes and be willing to consider some other solutions. And whether or not that's a policy solution or whether or not that's just saying, hey, you know, what can I do? What community can I be part of? If you're part of a faith community, how is our faith community reaching out to people maybe who are coming out of a treatment center close to us and offering them a place to find a, a, a family? A, uh, maybe even if they've lost their own relationships with their family, can we, can we help them find a place where they can call home and a place that they can rebuild? Yeah. Boy, that is so good. Wow. <laughs> what very very powerful and again christina i appreciate you for the way you're looking at this problem in a different light and i don't believe anything happens by accident i believe god places people where they're supposed to be and you know i i just feel like the lord wanted us to have this conversation today so thank you let folks know how they can connect with you and find out more about End It For Good. I, I mentioned at the top of the, the podcast, enditforgood.com. But but again, let folks know where there's other ways that they can connect with you. Yeah, so we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at End It For Good MS, like Mississippi. Um, and then I am on those three as well at Christina B. Dent. And you can email me, Christina at enditforgood.com. I love getting emails from people who listen to podcast episodes. They send questions. They send their stories. I love hearing from people. Um, find us on social media. Head over to the website. If you want to see my TEDx talk, which is kind of the 20-minute journey of changing my mind and what I learned, that's on our homepage. And there's also a button that says Get Started. If you're kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm interested in learning more, click on Get Started. It'll give you some options of just ways you can keep learning. Um, and then there are ways that you can get involved if you're at the point of like, yeah, I'm on board and I would actually like to be part of this movement. So we respect people wherever they are. Like I said, it was a two-year journey for me. I don't, um, it, it is completely unhelpful to me to try to force people to think a certain thing. Um, I think people yeah. need to work through their questions in their minds. And we try to provide content on social media that helps people wherever they are on that journey. If they're just beginning to rethink what we're doing with drugs, or if they want to be part of helping more people rethink it, uh, there's space for you and a safe place for you, no matter where you are. I love that. Find, find them on social media, end it for good MS on Twitter and Instagram, Christina B. Dent, Twitter, Instagram, um, Christina, this has been, and Facebook as well too. Christina, this has been great conversation. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for joining us on the Intentional Encourage podcast. Thanks, Brian. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Means. And of course, the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. If you're not subscribed to the Intentional Encourager podcast, hit the subscribe button wherever you get podcasts so you don't miss an exciting episode where you can get encouraged and stay encouraged. And remember, anyone, anywhere, at any time, any place can be an intentional encourager.